Uh, today we're going to be reading out of uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. I do, I am going to have them on the screen as I read them for you. The text is kind of small. <laughs> so if you guys want to uh, pull it up from uh, your Bibles to follow along, uh, definitely feel free to do that. And so, oops, there we go. So it says this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. And so this is a, a lengthy piece of text, but something that's definitely important for us to know here, just as context, is that uh, Matthew chapters 30, 23 to 25 make, make up what is Jesus' last block of teaching before he goes off to be crucified before uh, his resurrection, uh, really before uh, the end game, uh, per se. And so this is the teaching that Jesus is leaving them with. And actually, the, the text that I just read to you guys is his final, final, final part of that block of teaching that he gives to them. And, this, and right after this, we have uh, his Last Supper, and everything kicks off. And so that should really like, point out to us how important it is, this message that he's trying to get across to them. And so understanding how important it is, uh, how do we begin dissecting this? And so what I, what I want to show to you guys is basically uh, a core truth that I think we can get from this text, uh, being God expects us to love him above all else, and that love for him should translate into loving others in a perfect, sacrificial way. Because keep in mind, what Jesus is talking about here, this isn't just any kind of like, um, you know, normal love others uh, uh, type message. It's not just this, hey, love others when it's convenient for you type message. But really what he's talking about, and we'll go more into that, is a sacrificial kind of love that he expects us to show other people. And on top of that, it's a love that should come from our personal love for him. Because if it comes from just a sense of obligation, if it comes just from, uh, you know, uh, from, from a heart that says, oh, I can't believe I have to do this, but I guess I got to, then that doesn't really mean anything to him. And so uh, with that, what I want us to uh, really, what, 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 I, what I was asking myself when I was preparing this, and what I want you guys to be asking yourselves as we go through this message, is do you find yourself naturally loving others in the ways we're going to be speaking about today? Uh, because like, we, like I just said, this is a very special kind of love that Jesus is talking about, right? And so, that being said, who is Jesus talking about here, right? So I, I titled this message, if you guys saw at the beginning, The Least of These. Uh, most people, uh, if you've been a Christian for a while, uh, or even just a short time, this is probably a, a, a set of verses that you've heard before, right? The least of these. And so the first question that we should be asking ourselves is, okay, well, who are the least of these, right? And I believe that falls into two categories. The first one... Uh, being our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? And so the first truth that we're going to be talking about here is that God wants us to show sacrificial love to our brethren in Christ. And so what does that look like? Well, we see here, right, when Jesus, uh, when, when the king, when, when God addresses them, he says this, he says, uh, for I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. That's the first part, right? So what do those two things have in common? Well, they're a material need that the least of these have, right? They're a need that they cannot fulfill on their own. Maybe they're hungry because they don't have anywhere to get food, right? Maybe they're, they're thirsty because they can't afford to get something to drink, right? And so 
Well, we see here, also we see exemplified in Jesus' ministry, right? We see him uh, in situations where he's teaching, where masses are following him. And if you really, really think about it, Jesus doesn't have to feed them. He doesn't have to give them anything to drink. He, in all reality, doesn't even have to heal them. He's God. He, he, they, they don't really deserve anything from him, and yet he always goes out of his way to heal. He always goes out of his way to provide, and always to provide for people that cannot reciprocate and provide for him. Right? And so when we first talk here, and this is part of what, what, the reason why I'm saying this isn't just any kind of love. This isn't like the kind of love that you have uh, for someone that you spend some time with. This isn't some kind of love that you have that's exclusive only to like uh, uh, your family members. This is the kind of love that will call you to do things even when it's inconvenient for you. It's the kind of love that will call you to provide for others even though they will not be able to provide for you in the future. It's the kind of love that expects you to forego your own interests for the interests of others. And so when we talk about, okay, well, how do you take care of someone's physical needs, right? And, and there's, there, there's all kinds of examples that we can, that we can speak of here. But even just uh, here in El Dorado, there's plenty of people that struggle to put food on the table for their family. There's plenty of people uh, who have suffered, uh, uh, you know, maybe losing hours at work due to uh, uh, this COVID situation. There's people that get laid off. There's people that have all kinds of extenuating circumstances that make it hard for them to put food on the table, right? There's people here who maybe do not have the ability to go out and do things, right? There's maybe people that suffer from disabilities, people that don't have the capability to fend for themselves. And so what is Christ telling us here? That especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not just to ignore those people. We're not just to go on our merry way and be like, well, you know, I mean, I'm provided for, and my close friends are provided for, and my family's provided for. Uh, I don't have time to be dealing with anybody else. What Christ expects us to do is the same thing that he himself did for people in his earthly ministry and what he continues to do for us today, which is go out of his way to be there for us, in spite of the fact that we cannot do that for him. Right? And so what does that translate to? Well, it translates to asking somebody like, hey, um, I maybe noticed... Um, that you're going through a rough time lately. Is there any way that I can help you? you know, and this doesn't even require you to be rich. You're not supposed to have maybe all this money that you can throw around. Even if you don't have that, there's nothing wrong with asking somebody, hey, how are you doing? Is there anything that you need? Is there anything that I myself can help you with? And that, and that goes also beyond just physical needs. right? When we, when we look here in the next part of the verse, it says, um, I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Talk about someone that can't reciprocate for you. <laughs> someone who's imprisoned. Yeah. You know, you go out of your way to visit them. You go out of your way. They physically cannot do the same for you. And I feel like a lot of the time, and, and myself included, I, I, I find myself sometimes thinking like, oh, I, I can't believe that I, I have to go out of my way to be there for this person. I can't believe, you know, it's like emotionally draining. It drains my time. I can't believe that this person constantly needs me. And that's such a dangerous way to think. And it's such an ungodly way to think, too, especially towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? When we look, actually, uh, right here in, in John chapter uh, 13, verses 34 to 35, Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. How can we call ourselves children of God? How can we call ourselves disciples when we don't even care what another fellow ch that child of God is doing. When we actually, again, just, just think about that. Because when, when we think about, okay, what's the purpose behind me being there for people? And, and there's a couple of purposes. One of them is just that, as we're going to go into a little bit later, if you truly love Christ, then you should love his people. Right? When we look at, at these verses, uh, and this actually took me uh, a little while to figure out, when he's talking about the least of these at the beginning, he specifically says, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren... The least of these are Jesus' brethren. They're our brethren. And so how can I look at someone who's supposed to be my brother and sister in Christ and just say, yeah, I, I don't care what happens to you. I got too much on my plate. Can you imagine if our Savior did that to us? If he was like, hey, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm quite literally God. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I have so many things to do. Like, I, I could not care less. Can you imagine if that was his response? And so we're glad to say, man, I love my God. I can't believe that he goes out of his way for me, not just in the moment of my salvation, but I can't believe that he continues going out of his way to provide for me, to be there for me in my darkest hour, 
oh, but when it's my turn to do it for somebody else, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I can do that. How hypocritical is it of us? And if we're honest with ourselves, if you're honest with yourself, I'm sure that you'll find that there's plenty of times where you've been guilty of doing that because I know that I have. But what matters is that we continue going back to, again, these verses like these and just going back to loving our God and saying, Lord, please create in me a heart that wants to love others and that sees others the way that you see them. Right? And, and going into that, we also have another verse in, in Philippians, if I can get this to work. There we go. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so once again, our heart here is key. Because you can 100% donate to charity. You can 100% donate some of your time to be there, uh, work at a soup kitchen or do something like that. But if your heart is not, is not in it, that's not worship to God. If your heart's not in it, if, if, if you're not doing it out of love for him first and foremost and out of love for others, he doesn't care. It's empty. Right? And so... When we look, and this verse is key, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, because these are terms that are talking about the heart. And so how do we handle a heart issue? Because if we're honest with ourselves, it's really hard to handle. It's really hard to change the way that we are. It's really hard to change our attitudes and just attitudes that have been really ingrained in our hearts. And the answer to that is the gospel. The answer to that is allowing Christ to change you to being the person that he wants you to be. Because the truth is that if we get just completely preoccupied in just being just purely religious for the sake of being religious. We get preoccupied on like, okay, well, this is just another thing in my checklist that I got to check off that I'm doing for God. Then we're completely missing the point because our hearts are not being transformed. Our minds are not being transformed. And how can we expect to really offer that up as, a, as an acceptable sacrifice to our God? And so part of that, again, is not just being there for people in, in terms of like their physical needs. When we talk about people who are in jail, people who are sick, or maybe you can't do anything to help them, right? Look at what Romans chapter 12, verses 15 through 16 says. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another and do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. It may be that you don't have any feasible thing that you can do to make the situation better. It may be that you do not have the resources to help this person. It may be that it's not even a physical need, it's just they're, they're going through a really depressing time. It may be that they're hurting, it may be that they're, they have some extenuating circumstances outside of your control, but that doesn't mean you can't weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. That doesn't mean that you can't be there for them and say, hey, you know what? Even if everyone else leaves you, the same way that my God doesn't leave me, I won't leave your side. I'll be here for you, even when it's inconvenient for me. I'll make time, I'll take time out of my day to come see you, even though I'd rather be doing something else. Because you're important to me. Because the truth is that, again, our Lord isn't asking us to do anything that he himself hasn't already done for us here. And so, uh, when we continue here, again, how do we go ahead and, I guess, begin changing our hearts how do we begin making our hearts and our minds be transformed for God? It is precisely uh, here I have it in 1 Peter 4.8. It says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. There's a reason why scripture tells us to keep fervent, to pursue these things. Because it turns out that sacrificial love isn't something that comes to us naturally. It's not something that you want to do, right? I mean, like, who, who wants to sacrifice their own time, their own resources for someone that maybe they don't even know very well? This is only the kind of love that you can achieve. This is a renewal of your mind that you can only achieve by asking Christ to do that for you, by constantly pursuing it. Because I know that I myself am guilty of just falling to complacency, just sitting down and saying, hey, you know what? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, you know, I love others, and I'll be there for people if they need me. But never going out of my way to ask people, like, hey, how are you doing? You need me to pray for you. Do you need someone to be there for you? Because the truth is that this kind of love does not pair with complacency at all. You can never sacrifice. You're never going to even be willing to sacrifice when you're looking at it from a standpoint of complacency. And so, what is the ultimate goal of showing this type of love to one another? Well, first and foremost, to bring glory to our God. And second, so that when people who don't know him, from the outside looking in, see the way that we love one another as Christ told his disciples, they will know that we're different. 
they'll know that we're his disciples just by the way that we love one another. Imagine if you yourself were an unbeliever and you come uh, to a church and you see everyone bickering, you see people, you see the broken, you see people that are, are really having a rough time and no one cares about them. That's not a kind of love that you're going to want. If anything, it's, it's, it's the kind of experience that will make you say, hey, these people are just hypocrites. It's the kind of experience that will just make you say, hey, you know, they keep talking about love, they keep talking about a God that loves and a God that transforms, but I don't see anything that, here that I, could get, that I couldn't get somewhere else. And so it's important that we treat each other that way, not just for God's sake, not just for each other's sake, but for the sake of the lost and for the sake of unbelievers. And so that also moves then, since these verses are talking about, again, Christ's brethren or the king's brethren, think about how you become a brother and sister in Christ. It's with someone who's a Christian that goes out of their way to share the love of Christ with you. And so the truth, uh, truth number two that I want us to kind of talk about here, if I can, there we go. It's God wants us to show sacrificial love to the lost. All right, going back to our, to our uh, uh, core text here, it says, I was a stranger and you took me in. So it's not just talking about people here that you're comfortable being with. And we all, I'm sure all of us have friends that are unbelievers that we're comfortable with. And, and yeah, they're included in this, but it's also talking about people that maybe you yourself would not be very comfortable around. And when, our, when we ask ourselves, okay, well, what kind of people are these? Ask yourself, what kind of people did Jesus spend time with during his ministry? He spent time with um, prostitutes. He spent time with tax collectors. He spent time with people that no one else wanted to associate with. People that everyone else had cast out. And even when other religious leaders would say, hey, what are you doing spending time with these people? Jesus didn't care. Because at the end of the day, he wasn't there just to please other people. He wasn't there just to meet the standard, the, the arbitrary standards of someone else. He was there to reach the broken and to reach the lost. And so what we need to ask ourselves is, okay, am I going out of my way to sacrificially love the lost? Do I just hand them a Bible tract every once in a while? Do I just tell them, uh, you know, oh, well, maybe I'll pray for you every once in a while? Or do I go out of my way to, even if they keep rejecting the gospel, to continue showing them the love that comes forth from the gospel? Because at the end of the day, even if they don't want to hear your message, even if they're like, hey, you know what, I, I don't want you to proselytize to me, I don't want to listen to this, you can always show them that love, and in their time of need, they will remember that when everyone else left them, you didn't. And they'll remember that when everyone else left, when no one wanted, to do any, I wanted anything to do with them, you stayed there. And when they ask you why, you can say, because my God wanted me to. If it weren't for my God, I probably wouldn't be here. And the same kind of love that I show you, my God is perfectly willing to show you. And so, how do we show them love? Well, number one, we share the gospel with them. Right? There's no more loving thing that we can do, especially as Christians when we believe that without the gospel, someone's going to spend an eternity in hell. This, this is what these verses are talking about. That on the day of judgment, the sheep will be separated from the goats. And only the sheep belong to the shepherd. The goats have nothing to do with them. And so the most loving thing that we can do is share the gospel with them. And a lot of the time, that's one of the hardest things for us to do, right? Because sometimes maybe we think we don't know enough to share the gospel. Sometimes we think, hey, you know what? I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to come off the wrong way to them. But at the end of the day, if, I, if you avoid sharing the gospel for that reason, you are once again falling to the trap of selfishness and complacency. Because for your own temporal benefit of I don't want to feel uncomfortable, you could have forsaken someone's eternity. And so it matters the way that we treat others. It matters that we take them in, even as strangers. Because that's the kind of person that you remember. Right? I mean, sometimes we remember when a family member helps us out. But especially when someone goes out of their way who we don't know, who we don't normally associate with, and they go out of their way to help us, that's something that sticks with us. It's something that we remember. And so, number one, we share the gospel with them. And also, number two, we show them the evidence of our faith through taking care of them in all the same ways that we would take care of a brother and sister in Christ. We go out of our way to say, hey, you know what, I've noticed you've been going through a hard time. How can I help you? We go out of our way to say, hey, you know what, uh, it seems like you've been, like, oddly quiet recently. Is everything okay? Hey, you know what, I, I heard that this happened in your family. Like, how, how are you holding up? Right? And it's not just a matter of, of, of a, a, as a little uh, a token, just saying it one time. It's a matter of being intentional about it and going out of your way to next time you see them, hey, I remember you confided in me the following. How are you doing? Are, are you doing any better? Is there anything that's changed from last time where maybe I can help you? And just constantly, constantly showing them the love of Christ. 
Right, I think it's best exemplified when we look at, um, um, one second, yeah, Romans chapter 12, um, verses uh, 15 through 16, or actually, no, I'm sorry, that's uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 9, 9, verses 19 through 23. Paul writes this, he says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. And so ask yourself, are there people that I don't reach out to because I don't want to be seen around them? Are there people that I don't spend time with, that I don't show the love of Christ to, because if others saw me, I'd be ashamed to be with them. Because when you look at what Paul is talking about here, even though, uh, um, and even at a certain point in time, Paul being one, the, the first to reach out to the Gentiles, that's not something that other Jewish people in his community wanted. Even people, even plenty of people that became Christian who were previously Jewish, they did not want him to reach out to the Gentiles. And Paul did it anyway. Even when people looked down on him, Paul went out of his way to do it anyway. And why? That I might by all means save some. And so ask yourself today, is that, really what I stri- is that really my goal in life? Is that really what I strive for? Do I go to all lengths that I might save some? That at the end of my journey, I might hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Is that our goal? Or are we really just grabbing what should be our main life purpose that's given to us by God and putting that way down the line? And so... It's easy in a message like this, and especially when, when, in a text like this, right? Because at the very end, it says that he's separating the goats from the sheep. And he says, uh, uh, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so to me, even just looking at this text, it was really convicting. And it's easy to come away thinking to, to, to yourself, man, I want to be found among Christ's sheep on judgment day. There's no way that I can perfectly love God. There's no way that I can perfectly love someone else, there's no hope for me. And the thing is, you'd be right were it not for the fact that the good news of the gospel is that while God requires perfect obedience and he requires perfect love, he looks up, if you're a Christian, he looks upon Christ to fulfill that for you. If you're a Christian, even though you fail, even though he expects you to show sacrificial love, he knows that you're going to fail and he doesn't expect perfection out of you because he expected that out of Christ, and he got it from him. And so, instead of being filled with um, uh, conviction that goes nowhere, it's important that when we're convicted uh, with, with a text like this and with a message like this, that we look upon the sinless life and finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. Because the truth is that if you and I could perfectly, sacrificially love someone else, we would be doing that. <laughs> if you and I could suddenly put all of our selfish ambitions aside for somebody else, we wouldn't need a verse telling us to do it. The truth of the matter is that without Christ, not only are you going to be incapable of loving other people, you're going to be absolutely incapable of loving God the way that you're supposed to. And at the end of the day, when we're talking about love here, we're not just talking about, like we said before, some kind of capricious capricious, um, uh, following of, of a set of rules. We're talking about loving our creator who went out of his way for us. Because as we've been talking about this entire time, He's not asking us to do anything that he himself wouldn't do. The truth is that Christ paid our sin debt before the Lord, and when he asks us to love the least of these, it's because he himself came to die for the least of these. He came to die for you, he came to die for me, and he came to die for anyone else that would receive him. And so, in fact, Scripture tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verses 10-11, through 11, it says, And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Because brothers and sisters, the truth is that in order to follow Christ, we ought to be willing to follow him, even if it means, means being uncomfortable. If we, if we ought to follow Christ, that means that we ought to be willing to follow him, even if it means investing time and effort into others that we don't want to invest in. The truth is that if we want to love Christ, if we want to follow him, we ought to be able to follow him even unto death. How can we call ourselves his followers and say that we'd be willing to follow him unto death 
if we're not even willing to follow him in loving someone else the way that he loves them. And so I wonder today, do you find yourself naturally wanting to show Christ's love to the broken? Do you find yourself wanting to show Christ's love to your brothers and sisters in Christ? And if you don't, then it's time to ask yourself why. Is it because despite of the fact that you come here every Sunday and maybe you've grown up in church, you know the ins and outs of all the Bible stories in church, but maybe you don't actually have Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior over your life? Could it be that you have knowledge of him, but you haven't actually given your life to him? And for those of us that are certain that we belong to him, we're certain that we've been saved, what we need to really be asking ourselves, and we need to ask yourself is if you find yourself drifting away from him, if you find yourself not naturally uh, having an outpouring of love toward others, could it be that you've been forsaking your relationship with him? Could it be, could it, could it be that you've been setting him to the side? You haven't been prioritizing him. You haven't been prioritizing his word. You just said, well, you know, I have my fire insurance. I'm not going to hell. I'm time to not worry about this anymore. Or are you actually treating him like the king of your life? Because the truth is that a king deserves nothing but respect. Especially our heavenly king and father who would go out of his way for us deserves nothing more than our devotion. But the good news is that even if you find yourself, whether you find yourself drifting away from him because of a lack of taking care of your relationship with him, or whether you find that you maybe have never actually trusted him to be the Lord over your life, the, tr the, the good news is that it's not too late. Because you can go ahead and do that today. The good news is that if, if you don't know him and you want to know him, you have free access to the finished work of life, uh, the finished uh, life and work of Jesus on the cross. And if you've been drifting away from him, the good news is that the same Holy Spirit who indwelled you on the day of your salvation can once again stir up your love for him. All you have to do is just pray and ask him to help you today. Um, and uh, that being said, I'm going to have... Uh, uh, the band uh, come up, and, and while they do that, uh, I want to take some time to, again, what, like I said earlier, one of the things that we can really do is pray for one another, is go to our heavenly God for the needs of another. And so uh, what I'd like to do, uh, if you guys will uh, uh, close your eyes and bow your heads, um, I want to pray for us, and I'll pray for you guys. Uh, if you'll lift your hand, if you have some kind of uh, prayer, if you want the Lord to maybe help you renew your relationship with him today, if you find that your love has been lacking, if you'll raise your hand, I'll pray. I'd love to pray for you. Um, if you find that uh, you're not sure that he actually is Lord over your life, you're not sure that you've actually taken that step, uh, if you'll raise your hand, I'd love to pray for you at this time as well. And uh, if you just have some kind of prayer request for somebody around you, maybe an unbeliever, maybe someone who's a brother and sister in Christ who have been struggling in life recently, if you'll raise your hand, I'd love to pray for you as well. And so that being said... Uh, let's go to our Father together. Dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, each and every single person that is here. I thank you because they made the time uh, to just come here to worship you. They make the time, Lord God, to be there for me and Victoria. Uh, even when it's inconvenient for them, I know that they make the time to be there for others. I beg you to please be with everyone here, Lord God, that maybe finds that they've been slacking in their relationship with you. Just send your Holy Spirit to stir up love for you once again. I beg you to please be with uh, everyone here who has a, a friend or family member, someone that they know who's lost, who needs you, Lord God. I beg you please just help that person to see the need that they have for you. Be with everyone else here, Lord God, that has a prayer request, whether it's about illness, whether it's about a financial situation. I beg you to please help them to know that despite of what happens, you're there with them. I beg you to please just help us uh, as a church to show your love, not just to one another, but to everyone, Lord God. Help us to show your love to the lost. Help us to show your love to the broken the same way that you showed your love to us when we were once lost and broken. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.